coffee.
what is up my fellow fader finaglers you guys rock welcome back to another sound advice saturday and today we're just going to be doing the same thing that we do every saturday we're going to be talking shop talking audio and i've actually got some pretty cool things i want to cover today as far as debunking some audio myths that i think need to be addressed because from the most part what i see is there's a lot of stuff that's being said being typed wrote about questions that are being asked from the wrong standpoint and basically it's all bad information so what better to do on sound advice saturday but to actually answer some of these questions that people are having that they're not getting the right answers to now by no means am i saying that i know everything but i know a lot after been doing this now for over 20 years uh professionally for at least 10 you want to call it that 10 11 maybe um yeah i would call it 11 and then uh, essentially from there we're just going to kind of catapult off of that into any kind of questions you guys may ask as usual too i love to take uh this is an open forum so i love to take questions as well and answer them on the fly and it doesn't have to be just cakewalk related i know a lot of people uh, have said in the past well the reason why i didn't hop on because i thought this was just nothing but a cakewalk channel <laughs> and as much as it might as well be um no we actually answer all kinds of things here so if you have any question whatsoever if you're new to this you're wanting to learn more you're in the right place not only uh, can i help you but there's usually a ton of people in the chat that are very knowledgeable as well and are able to help you too if this is your first time here i'd like to uh, welcome you with sort of the creed that we adhere to around here and that is that this channel exists to simplify the complexities of the home studio and to help you make professional sounding music in a less than professional space now we can dream alone and we can create alone but together we can achieve so much more so thank you guys so much yet again for stopping by for another sound advice saturday let's go ahead and give some honor where honor is due let's talk about our chart toppers we actually got some new ones uh eventually this is going to get full and then I'm going to have to create like two pages of these things, which is fine. I'm fine with that. James Sheets still sitting at the top with a $20 Super Chat donation, $10 a month Patreon member. We got Zave Ryan with $11 in donations. He's a $1 a month Patreon member. VST404 just hopped on board for a $5 a month membership for the Patreon channel. Uh, Patreon channel? Patreon page? I, what, I don't know what to call that the community over there and then uh mark burke's dollar he's a ten dollar super chatter marcity 101 five dollar super chatter and someone who stumbled upon this live stream by accident last time silvermane wesley john while he was here got enough value out of it he contacted me afterwards he might actually be hitting me up for some mixing services and uh he was said i was elated with the fact that i found you guys it was a great great time there so he donated five bucks in the super chat as well and that's what it's all about folks that's what it's all about i want to talk a little bit about just real quickly give another shout out to chris sanders who was the winner of the quarantine song challenge um and also i'd like to put this out there that if anybody knows how to contact chris i i think i can get a hold of him maybe through john lowry i think they're um, I tried to find him on Facebook and I'm just not sure if it's the right account, but he has yet to send me the song uh, that he wants me to mix and master for free for winning that contest. And I'm just kind of, um, I don't know if maybe he's still trying to get things together or I just don't want him to uh, forget that he did win that. I think maybe my thought was, well, maybe he came in on the last half of it and didn't know that you actually won something other than recognition. So at any rate, um, if you know how to get a hold of Chris or you see him on the interwebs anywhere, send him my way and be like, Hey, you, you got a free mix and master, buddy. Head on over to Home Studio Simplified and get that. Uh, the other thing was Michael R had won a, if you all know where Michael R hangs out, he won a mix critique and I didn't know he didn't, um, follow up with me to let me know if he wanted me to do a mix critique on the song that he submitted for this challenge or if he, um, Remember When, that's the name of it. I was trying to read it on the screen here, but I blurred it out. Uh, Remember When was the name of that song. It was a really good song. I didn't know if he wanted me to 
do the mixed critique on that song or if he was going to send me another song that he wanted me to critique but I have yet to get that as well and I don't want anybody to feel like if they win something on the channel or uh, they're blessed with something that I'm I'm giving away that they're not going to get it so I want to make sure I keep it fair and make sure that everybody's getting what's coming to them so it's good to see some familiar faces in the chat as well love to see you all hopping on here I have posted a link as you can see in the chat right now uh, for the 4,000 subscriber giveaway I was gonna wait until I got to 5,000 because it was actually going rather quickly and I thought well I'm gonna miss it and then I thought no I, I think I want to do this anyway so um, if you're not familiar with that just hop on that link there um, go check it out basically I'm giving away to three different people my compression simplified course and then three more people are going to get my Cakewalk by BandLab tutorials course. So six things in total. Um, all you have to do is simply complete a bunch of steps on there. It's like it's like your typical raffle copter gleam IO type giveaway deal where basically you complete a number of steps to get entries into the giveaway. So um, afterwards, we're going to be doing a 5,000 sub giveaway here before too long, I hope. And I've actually ordered some products for that. So we're going to be giving away some pretty cool stuff um, for the 5,000 sub. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I reached out to one of my favorite favorite headphone companies, which make also some great microphones. And they're going to be hooking us up. So um, I actually got a pretty good deal through one of their uh, discount codes they gave me. They said they liked my idea of, of giving away one of their products on my channel. So they gave me a 20% off discount code so that I could buy something to give away to you guys. So, and by the way, the money that came from me being able to buy those things to give back came from the super chats. So yet again, it's like all of this just, you know, helping one another out. And so once again, not only can I say thank you for the super chats that have been donated, but eventually you guys are going to say thank you especially whoever wins um, those headphones i'll have to show you a picture of those maybe on the next live stream uh, but i i wanted to get some some pretty high-end um, headphones that i feel comfortable that i've used before that i feel comfortable that i could give away and say hey these would be great for tracking and for mixing so yeah that'll be coming out on the 5000 sub giveaway but uh, this one here is just going to be courses that I'm giving away. And the cool thing about this one that I, unlike uh, some of the other giveaways that I've seen is you can actually get up to 10 entries just for sharing it with other people. So uh, the more you share, the, the closer you get to actually winning yourself too. Now, if you've already got those courses and you're thinking, well, I've already won those. There's no need for me to enter. Please go ahead and enter anyway. Um, if you've already got those courses, we can work out another deal. So keep that in mind because the main thing is I want to get that shared out there for as many people as possible to see. So of course, as usual, this happens every single stream with the same cup. I'm trying to create consistency here, the same black shirt. <laughs> I think every, every studio owner has to have a black shirt. Um, all right, Mark George is hopping in. He's being the first one to ask a question. Good deal. He says, you know, when you talk about polarity reversal and making wave peaks and troughs match, does that work only on real live sounds like guitar sounds, or will it work also on MIDI and VST sounds also? Actually, yes, it works on both. Uh, one thing that I do want to clarify from that, because the situation arose where I had an individual who got with me and he said, I'm having a really rough time trying to get all of these tracks, their polar polarities to match. Uh, one thing that I want to make mention of is if it's a, a different um, source, like say, for instance, if it's a piano and a bass guitar, you, you don't have to worry so much about the polarity matching on those. Um, because intrinsically by nature, all musical instruments are going to combat each other in a mix. And that's why we have EQs and compression, things like that to take care of some of that. But um, now if it's if it's a double tracked acoustic guitar, 
uh, especially if it's a, an acoustic guitar that has been mic'd and then the other source is DI'd, then you definitely want to worry about polarity. Uh, but the polarity flipping can benefit sometimes across the board on, on several different things. But what I'm, I'm saying is like, don't get caught up in like, everything's got to be matching because it doesn't. Uh, and the reason for that is just simply because, um, like say, for instance, the fundamental frequencies of a bass guitar are, are around the 70 Hertz range and the fundamental frequencies on a male vocal are around 1K to 2K. So... Those are vastly different, so you don't have to worry so much about those areas uh, polarity. Now, and the main thing where that comes in play too with polarity is when you're using um, like a figure of eight microphone, um, because usually there's there's a polarity flip there, so one side of it will be on um, sort of take up one polarity space, I, I guess, and the other side will will take up another. Uh, or for instance, um, there's a really cool way to track um, acoustic guitars where you take a figure of eight microphone. And if you're not sure what that is, I'll go ahead and draw a picture real quick. So all, all microphones have a polar pattern, right? We have a cardioid polar pattern that kind of looks like a heart. And we have an omnidirectional pulley pattern, polar pulley? polar pattern that looks like a circle and then we have like super cardioid that looks like a really pointy heart but then the figure of eight I mean literally if you can even see that uh, it's probably hard to see yeah right there a figure of eight literally looks like a figure of eight but what you can do is actually in that null point of the eight so the two sides that make up the eight is predominantly where the microphone will pick up the middle is like a null point where it still picks up, but not quite as much. So what you can do is in that null point, you can put a uh, small diaphragm condenser like right there in the middle. And essentially, if you record it that way, you can get both the sides and then the middle. And you will have to flip the polarity on that because um, just the way it it works. Intrinsically, you will have to flip the polarity on that to get it to sound stereo like you're wanting it to um, now one way to cut down on phase issues which is nine times out of ten why you would want to flip your polarity is because of a phase issue um, if you want to deal with that uh, on the front end one way that you can deal with phase issues before you even have to worry about flipping polarity is to use the three to one rule so say for instance if I am recording a uh, acoustic guitar with two microphones maybe I have one on the sound hole and then I have one that I'm using for like an ambience or a room type speaker or another small condenser mic uh, what I want to do then is I want to either one make sure that the condenser capsules are like identically close together which is going to help uh, which may not actually provide a better sound just simply due to the fact that because they're both together, um, you're basically going to get the same sound. It's just going to be colored from two different mics. So you get two different colors of the same sound. However, what most people like to do, what I like to do is I like to put a microphone just over the shoulder pointing down uh, past the ear of the guitarist, which sort of lets that microphone hear what the guitarist is hearing. And then I like to point one about 12 inches away from the fretboard at the 12th fret something about the number 12 there, but in order to keep the phase cohesion, uh, the three to one rule says for every microphone that you add to it, you have to have it within a three foot space to keep your phase uh, alignment. So the one that's over the shoulder, I will literally take out a tape measure and marry, uh, marry, measure from the condenser capsule of one to the capsule of the other at exactly three feet. Now, is it going to be perfect? No, but nine times out of 10, it will yield a lot better results and you won't have to worry so much about polarity issues. See what happens when you ask a question on here. I just, I go off on like a tangent for ever. And um, so I hope I answered your question, Mark. <laughs> uh, which actually brings me to a good point because one of the things that I wanted to talk about today 
for Sound Advice Saturday was uh, debunking some of these audio myths. I won't have time to get to all of them that I want to talk about. Uh, but one thing that I do want to uh, especially get to is <clears throat> a question that I've had quite frequently. Excuse me, by the way, for clearing my throat in the mic. I had someone ask me the other day uh, through social media the um, the need for higher sample rates. And they went on and on this this big long thing about how someone had basically told them that because they're not recording in 96K, that all of their recordings are essentially going to come out like junk. Now, I want to publicly address that right here, right now, and let each and every one of you know, especially if you're new to this, that recording at the highest sampler, sampling rate possible is not going to yield better results in the sense of um, in the sense of you getting like pristine quality recordings. Really, it all comes down to mic placement. It all comes down to which mic you're using. Um, and that doesn't mean like how expensive the mic is, but that just means are you using the right mic for that application? And then it also comes down to um, just general knowledge from, from our past. You know, we can learn a lot from the past. If you look at most of the albums that are still being played on the radio today, those were recorded in 16-bit audio, and they were recorded at a sample rate of 44.1 because that always was, and even today is, industry standard. So what happens is people get so caught up in wanting to record in these higher sample rates that they buy more expensive gear, but they still haven't got enough of the knowledge behind them to actually utilize the gear to its fullest potential to know what that extra 96k would even be useful for. And what happens is they spend all this money, invest all this time, and they and by buying all the shiny new products and the shiny new gear that they maybe don't even know how to use yet, they get it in their little studios and they start, you know, plucking around on it and playing around on it. And then they still end up with recordings that are less than desirable and then they start blaming themselves and they think, well, I, I can't do this. That's not the case. The case is you got to make sure that you're getting your information from the right source for one. For two, do a bunch of research. Don't just take my word for it. Don't take anyone else's word for it. Do the research yourself. There are tons and tons of resources online, um, actual college documents on sound design and audio. And uh, it, some of it's mind blowing. Uh, one book that I would definitely recommend that you check out. I mean, there's a lot of them on the market, but one book that really stands out over my years of research is Bob Katz mastering book. Bob Katz is a mastering engineer that goes all the way back to when before the loudness wars even took place. And that book, which the last time I checked, I think your local library should have it. If they don't, you can always put a request in for them to actually get it. And um, the thing about that is uh, if it's free and you can go and get it from your local library, definitely do so. If you can't, I would, I would still recommend buying it because it is that good of a book. Now, I lucked out. I don't know how this even happened. I think it might have been on his forum. He has a forum. I believe it's called Digi... Digi Digido, Digido, it's kind of a weird spelling, but he actually had on his form at one point in time, he had a free PDF download of his mastering book and somehow I got a, I got hold of it and I went back later uh, because I was going to copy the link and send it to someone. I was like, you got to check this book out. And then it was paid. It was like a paid for the link was no longer free. So I don't know if that was a something that, like a fluke or he was actually giving it away as a promotional at that point in time or something. I don't know, but Definitely check out that book. That book will explain probably in too much detail <laughs> some things that you uh, you need to know about sampling rates and bit rate. So essentially, in a digital world, um, sample rates basically just mean um, how many times that portion of audio is being sampled, how many seconds it's being, or how many times a second it's being sampled. So at 96K, it's being sampled at 96,000 times a second. And what you have then is 
um, you have it being sampled quicker, so you have less um, chances, I should say, for audio distortion, audio invariabilities, things of that nature. And so is it good to do that? Yes, but it's not imperative. So here's, here's my thought on it. If the music that's still being played on the radio was recorded at 16-bit 44.1, and it sounds amazing, and it's still being played on the radio, to me, that's good enough. Now, I can record in, in 24-bit 44.1, uh, if there's anything that you should upgrade other than worrying about your sample rates, it would be worrying about your bit rates. Now, because, and let me preface this by saying that um, I'm not being even stingy about this, because if all you have is an interface that can record at 16-bit, 44.1, you have more than enough. You have at your very fingertips the, the very same bit rates and sample rates that all of the most famous albums were ever made on. So don't worry so much about that stuff. But if you're going to upgrade anywhere, let it be your bit rate because your bit rate in a digital realm will give you far better results uh, just for headroom wise. And what I mean by that is you can, uh, you can actually save more audible dB space, if you want to call it that, in your mixes by using 24 bit. Um, you can record at lower levels without as much hiss in 24 bit. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that come into play with that, that why that would be a better area to go through. So, so to, for today's first debunking of the audio myth, uh, for today's first sound advice, here's some sound advice for you. I don't worry about sample rates and bit rates as much as everyone is telling you to. Okay. The main thing is that you hone your skills right now on the equipment that you have and you get as knowledgeable and as good with the equipment that you currently have, and that you release as much material as you possibly can. Not just record it, and not just mix it, but release it. And the reason why, there's a reason why it's called a release. Because literally, you learn from those experiences, you gain the knowledge, and then you literally release it for the world to hear it. And when you release it, you let it go. You say, okay, I've learned from that experience. I've gained some knowledge, but it's, it's gone. Now I'm moving on to the next thing. And every time that you do that, every time that you build up enough confidence to say, this sounds good enough for what I can do right now, I'm releasing it. Through that release, you actually gain this confidence in your skills. And you're going to, and you're probably thinking, well, what if I release it and it sounds like trash and then I go back years later, that's even better. And what I mean by that is <laughs> I, I've got stuff still here saved on my computer that was like some of the first things I've ever done on Cakewalk. And I can go back to those. I'm definitely not releasing those, but <laughs> I can go back to those at any given time as a benchmark. If I ever doubt my skills or if I ever am told, uh, I just got into a, a conversation not too long ago. I had an individual that told me basically that I stunk at doing what I'm doing. And um, I took it with a grain of salt, considering the source. But at the same time, during times like that, I can go back to that that mix that I first did and go, you know, I'm not all that bad. Listen to how it was and to how it is now. So by releasing things, by completing a large body of work, doing as much as you can possibly, you're going to learn tons from that. And you're going to learn more from that than you would even from manuals or from Bobcat's mastering book. You'll learn the technical knowledge from Bob, but you'll learn the hands-on, physical, uh, head knowledge, heart knowledge from the actual doing of a thing. So that's the first audio myth that I want to debunk today. Don't worry so much about sample rates and bit rates. I see it all the time on these forums and the Facebook groups and everybody gets jumping in there and they're like, dude, you can't, you don't have enough. Your equipment isn't expensive enough. You don't, uh, your space isn't good enough. And what happens is you get all of these people that are barking up different trees saying you got to have this and you have to have that and you have to have to have to, and they're not making any music themselves. 
because they're too busy hopping on forums telling everybody what they need to have. And nine times out of 10, I'm, I know I'm on a soapbox here, but I'm going to keep going with this. Nine times out of 10, what I have seen as well is the individuals that are, are the most staunchest defenders of high end gear. And that's the only way to get great music. If you go and you look at their websites or anything like that, they have nothing to show for it. So then if you start poking around and you're like, okay, obviously, you know, from what you've told me, um, you've, you've done a lot of this. So yeah, you, you know a lot. So can I see some of your work? I'd love to see some of your work. And I've asked people this who have been very staunch with me and, and adamant, adamant about telling me that some of the things, because a lot of things that I say are very polarizing. Um, for instance, plugin companies don't want to hear people like me say that you can have a great mix with stock plugins. And some of the guys who own those plug-in companies, or at least work for them, have gotten to some arguments with me before about that. But they can't prove me wrong. Um, but what I'm, I'm kind of going out on a limb here to say is, um, most of the time, those people that are putting that out there the most aren't even doing it themselves. So don't worry too much about what people are telling you that you can and cannot do. The fact is... There are million dollar records being made right now on GarageBand. Uh, there are tons of, I can, I can think of tons of records that were made in little itty bitty basements and uh, places that just seemed completely undesirable. Some of the greatest guitar effects and mixing effects that we have today, um, those were all done on accident. There's studio stories all around about how that, you know, John Lennon ac accidentally bumped into the tape machine and caused that tape delay or the, or the, the tape, tape stop effect and how that, uh, individuals on accident had hooked something up the wrong way and came up with phasing, uh, a, a phaser pedal. I mean, there's just, there's so many things that I, peop, you cannot, you cannot quantify music. And I've said this time and time again, yes, there are, there are many ways, uh, that are pretty much cut and dry, not clipping, you know, um, putting a pop filter in front of a microphone. If you have a singer, some of that stuff, I mean, that's pretty cut and dry, you know, to do that. That's just general knowledge, but the other stuff, like you have to record through a Neve console with a million dollar, uh, manly tubes compressor to get a great sound of vocal. No, you don't. You can do it with a DI source and a bunch of stock plugins. I mean, for crying out loud, people. Anyway, Captain Mick Gravy. Hey, nice to have you here, buddy. I think it's the first time I've seen you here, unless I just don't recognize the name. He says, Sublime's Robin the Hood was done on a four track and I wouldn't want it any other way. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. People get so caught up in the gear and they think that the gear is going to save them. The gear is going to make them have the best record ever. The gear is going to make their guitar tracks jump out of the speakers and sound like a million bucks. The gear does help to a certain extent, but the gear is just simply a tool. And it's, it's, I've said this time and time again as well, but you can put a hammer in the hand of any Joe on the street and they can drive a nail into a board. But if you put a hammer into a hand of a trained carpenter, they can build you a ton of things because they have a knowledge of a tool. And all of the stuff in the audio world, they're essentially just tools. A DAW is just a tool. Just because you're using Reaper or you're using Pro Tools or you're using doesn't mean that your songs or your music are going to sound better. It just means you're using a different tool. Um, now, are some tools more desirable? than others that depends on your workflow that depends on what you personally like and so yet again we come back to that you can't put it in a box when you get uh you get into the the plug-in sphere of things you got individuals who are die hard about certain plug-in brands and that's fine um but i can nine times out of ten find a free plug-in that will do the same thing sometimes even better so all right that's the first audio myth that i wanted to debunk today um, you guys have any questions whatsoever, just go ahead and throw that in the chat and we will check that out. 
I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I've already covered that. I have already covered 24-bit recordings, kind of skim the surface of that. So the next one that I want to cover is this whole stereo stereo idea. Now, this is not in the sense of the widening plugins that I just debunked not too long ago, um, which caught a, I caught a lot of flack for that one too. But yet again, uh, w there was one individual who actually, I'd love to show you his email, but I wouldn't do that to him. That would be rude. But he wrote me an email and he said, so what about all these guys using these stereo widening plugins that are making million dollar records and they're doing this and they're telling me that they're fattening their tracks up and then and in the mid point of his sentence he literally stopped himself in mid point of the sentence in the email and he goes oh well I guess I just answered my own question never mind great video cheers <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> uh, and the point that he was getting at was well these guys are using them and he answered his own question in the sense of saying he, re he remembered back and, and remembered wait a minute they're not using them across the entire mix they're using them on a single source to fatten the track up which even in my video, I said, that's a viable option for using a stereo widening plugin. My argument or rebuttal on that was basically just don't overdo it for one. And for two, don't think that that's going to be where your stereo field is going to come from. That mastered sound that actually comes from arrangement that comes from, um, mic placements that comes from EQ adjustments that comes from compression adjustments that comes from a lot of different things, but it doesn't come from a one, one plugin that you turn one knob and now everything's great. So, all right. Now I'm getting off on that tangent. A $30 Dan Electro pedal. <laughs> yeah. Right. Actually, Dan Electro has some pretty cool stuff. Um, I actually had, which one was that called? The Fab Distortion. And when you dialed it down to a lower setting... It was a really sweet little, like, thickener. I loved it. Wish I'd never got rid of that. You know, I was just thinking about that the other day. There's like a long list of things that I keep telling myself over and over. I wish I'd never got rid of that. Well, you can't uh, undo the past, but you can definitely learn from it. And I have. I'm going to quit selling everything and just start giving it away. <laughs> anyway, so... The next audio myth that I want to debunk, though, has to do with this whole stereo thing, and that is I've seen time and time again to the point where I'm like, I want to make, like, in my notes section on my phone, like a cut and paste where I can literally just copy that, and every time I see someone answer that way, um, I've got a chorus, and it goes wide. Yes, <laughs> chorus is definitely a great effect for that. Um, so... Anyway, I, I see someone that I just seen it today, actually. And that's another reason why I wanted to bring it up. I was hoping maybe one of the individuals would stop by here and get some good advice on that instead of listening to the plethora of individuals who are like, so essentially I'll just give you the, I'll give you the scenario. This is what, what happens, what I see. I want wide stereo guitars, electric guitars. We'll just use electric, for example. It can be any, but I want wide stereo electric guitars. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to post it in this Facebook forum and see what they think. And then about 50 people hop on there and they say, oh, dude, that's super easy. Just duplicate the track and pan it left and right. And I feel like facepalm. I'm like, guys, that have you even tested that theory out? You guys keep all you're doing is repeating stuff that other people are telling you that you can do that doesn't work. So and here's why it don't work. OK. An electric guitar is a mono source. If it's the exact same electric guitar, just like I showcased in the widening plugins debunk video, if you flip the phase on the two of those and they're both perfectly lined up, they're going to cancel one another out because it's the exact same piece of audio. So if you take the exact same piece of audio and you pan one left and one right, all you're getting is a mono signal louder. That's all it is. It's just basically doubling up the same mono signal. And so what people think is a wider sound, it's just getting louder. There's no width to it whatsoever. In fact, if you were to put one of the, the goinometers, which I've showcased on the channel, or use a, 
a free plugin like Span that shows you the correlation and the stereo width of things, it would even show you that it's not, it's not any wider. It's just louder. So then how do you go about actually achieving stereo width like that? And this is so simple. It just requires a little bit more work. And I think that's sometimes why people don't want to do it, but it really does work. So the best way to get stereo width from two electric guitars, we're just going to use that for an example, is to double track those guitars. So you record one, and, and here's even a, an extra side tip. You record one on your Stratocaster with the neck position. You record the second part on your same Stratocaster in the bridge position or in the middle position. But you double track it. You essentially lay down two parts, completely different uh, performances. Then when you go to pan that left and right, now because it's two different audio sources, then when you pan them left and right, yes, you are going to get stereo. But you cannot do it just by duplicating the same track and panning it left and right. That does not work. Now, the other option that I've also seen is where people say, well, you can duplicate them, pan them left and right, and then you can shift one of them by so many milliseconds, and then you get the stereo. Now, if you go back and watch that widening debunked plugin video, you'll notice that Yes, it does sound wider, but then it introduces phase issues. And when that phase issue is folded down to mono in a real world, like a car or earbuds um, or something on a stereo system in a house, suddenly those two guitars that sounded so great and so wide in your studio just sound like trash now because there's too many phase cancellation issues and phase uh, inversion issues, and it's just not... It's not jiving well. So the best way that you can obtain that stereo width is to literally re-record a second part and to even get it more wide sounding, record it on an, either a different guitar, a different neck position, use a different pick. That can even do a lot, especially because some people say, well, I've only got one guitar and I only play acoustic. There's no problem with that. There's some ways that you can go about doing that. Those little rubber uh, feedback destroyers Put that thing in your sound hole for one take. Take it out for the next. Um, use a different pick. Use a thinner pick the first time. Use no pick the next time or a hard pick the next time. But either way, those variances are going to add up to even to your ears being able to pick up, hey, this is a different sound and this is a different sound. So this is in stereo. So I hope that all made sense. Uh, Mark George, he says, Jean Michel Jarret. Recorded oxygen in an apartment on three second hand synths. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And there's story after story after story of that. Um, one of my favorite things that I love to show people. Uh, I had an individual. I posted something about uh, DIY bass absorption. Uh, bass trap broadband panel absorption. I made these here in my studio. And I posted kind of like my real quick video of running through about how I did them. And uh, the benefits I feel like that I got from it. Well, this individual had uh, seen that and he was like, you know, this DIY stuff, it gets under my skin. And, you know, we got people that's putting pantyhose on, on uh, clothes hangers and they're calling that a pop filter. And at that, I had to start laughing because immediately I knew I had already seen it somewhere else. So immediately... I snagged the picture off of, uh, there's a YouTube video of the original recording of Michael Jackson's We Are the World. you got to go check it out. At one portion of the video, I took a screenshot of that, that portion. Michael Jackson is singing into a Neumann mic with a, literally through pantyhose that are tied around, <laughs> that are tied around a clothes hanger. And I was like, that's awesome. So I sent it back. And I said, yeah, yeah, that DIY stuff is junk, isn't it? Silence. I love that. I love that. It just goes to show, guys, it, it's, it, when it comes to audio gear and which microphone I should use and which DAW I should use, all of these questions can be summed up in it matters more who's using it. And it matters more if you have 
not to sound rude or anything, but if you have the talent to use it. And talents, with music and things like that, talent, you're not always just born with talent. And you're not just always born being able to, you know, you don't come out of your mother's womb and have a guitar pick in your hand you can shred. The, it takes time. And that's like with anything. So while you're getting to that point, sort of reward yourself with better gear as you start earning that privilege to use that better gear. But until then, just use what you have and do a really good job with it. Learn it on the uh, inside and out. And the more that you improve the person, the more that you improve your own talent and skill, then it's going to pay off later when you get that more expensive gear because you're going to actually put it to proper use instead of, I can't remember the man's name right now, and I, I, I wouldn't say it anyway. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but there was someone on one of the forums that I'm, I'm a part of that posted a picture. He said, I'm brand new to mixing and mastering. I want your help. He was just broadly putting it out there for anyone to help him. And I thought, oh, that's really humbling, you know, that someone would get on there, and that's that's cool. That's a teachable person. I like that. So I extended to him, my services and said, Hey, hop on and over the channel. I've got plenty, plenty of tutorials here. Um, you know, I've got Skype sessions. I've got tutorial courses if you want to go that route. Um, but even if for free, you can come over here and ask questions at any time and I'll do my best to help you out. I'm very generous in this area. He was like, Oh, okay, cool. So he messaged me back. We talked a little bit and I said, so what kind of gear are you currently using? Not to ask him like, in gear snobbery manner, like what, what kind of gear are you using? Cause that's probably why you're not getting the million dollar recording. Okay. No, I was wanting to know, like, is there any way maybe I could help him with gear choices? Um, because he was wanting to record a specific type of music. I thought, well, maybe, um, it would help him by turning him on to, uh, some, some gear that would help him in that area. So he sends me a photo back through messenger and I am not kidding it looked like this dude had been in the recording business for 40 years I, I sent him a message back almost immediately and I said you're joking right and he said no why what do you mean is it bad I was like no your space looks amazing I mean he had he had a, a, a vintage I don't know if it was a Neve but he had a vintage console he had a tape deck he had a full uh, Pro, Pro Tools HD rig. He had, I mean, on and on it went. All of this, I mean, it was probably anywhere from sixty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars at least worth of material there, and had just started. And I got back with him, and I said, "Man, do you, do you even know how to?" I said, "I'm not trying to sound rude, but do you know how to use any of that?" And he said, "Well, no. That's why I'm reaching out to people." And I told him, I said, well, man, I'll, I'll do my best to get you up to speed, but I don't know if he just won the lottery or, or what happened. Rich uncle passed away. <laughs> I don't know. But I was like, good Lord, there is no need to have all that if you're not even sure what you're doing yet. So anyway, I've, I've been on this tangent for a while. Let's go ahead and spin the wheel. Who wants to spin? Who wants to spin the wheel? Anybody want to spin the wheel? Mark, George, you don't get a chance to say yes, because I already know you're going to say yes. <laughs> And if you're new here, there, this is the segment of the show where inadvertently and at any given time, um, I'll just get bored and say, let's spin the wheel. I also spin the wheel every single time that there's a super chat. And um, I, I don't think of it. There's any other time that I do it other than just someone asking. All right. So let's go ahead and spin the wheel of awesomeness. Ladies and gentlemen, the wheel of awesomeness. That's right. I'm trying to get away from my Casey Kasem voice and I'm moving more into a... I, I really don't know. It's that guy. You know that guy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to spin the wheel. You know the deal. We spin the wheel. Whatever the wheel lands on, it dictates what happens. Whether it be trivia, a favorite tutorial vid request, a song feature, or a mix critique. Either way, everyone walks away a winner. And let's spin. Nice. 
tutorial video request. Good deal. All right, so in the chat section right now, if any of you have a tutorial video that you would like to request to be done, I will then post that to the channel. Um, whatever tutorial, maybe it's something you were wondering about compression, EQ, maybe a, a specific plugin. I know recently I just kind of did a poll on the community tab and asked individuals um, about different areas and Melodyne came up with almost like 60% uh, approval rating. So I'm actually currently right now doing a, well, not right now, but <laughs> I'm in the process, I should say, of doing a Melodyne tutorial. And I got into the thick of it last night and realized, I think it was Mark, I think it was actually you that told me that there was a new update, Melodyne 5 now. Um, wow. Game changer. So there's a ton of stuff that they've added to this. The ability to see sibilance, the ability to, um, what was it? Oh, now you can actually lengthen phrases without lengthening the whole note. That's pretty cool. Uh, are the ends of phrases. So it will sound a little bit more, less robotic, I should say. Uh, Mario, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher your last name. Mario Stankovic. Let me know if I said that right. Mario Stankovic, he is requesting an EQ tutorial. We have a, anybody else that says that's a good idea. And here's, here's the thing about that. I have actually already had an idea to do an EQ tutorial, but one thing that I'd like to run by you guys, because I always like to do that anyway, I don't want to just spin my wheels and be like, hey, I know you guys are going to love this tutorial on how to make a puppy sound like a kitty. So <laughs> rather than try to create a tutorial that may or may not go over well with you guys that you don't even need, I love it whenever you guys can provide for me the information and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And then I can go, okay, I'm here to serve. Boom, here it is. Now, the way that I would want to do this, um, I've actually been thinking about this for a while now, is to just host a live event like we're doing right now. And instead of taking questions or debunking audio myths, um, I could actually just show you, share my screen with you, and we could go through a mix, and I could show you how I would EQ that mix together. So if that's something you all would be interested in, let me know. Um, and then I'll try to set something up like that. I'd like to get enough sort of uh, hype built around it, if you want to call it that, to where I could get enough people on board to help more. So I'd like to create it in such a way to where it would be a, a shareable um, type situation. So yeah, instead of just creating like a static EQ tutorial where you guys can't ask questions or like stop me and say, hey, why did you just do that? Um, I think it would be so much cooler if I could actually go and say, okay, we're going to do this live EQing a song today. We're going to EQ this song. Um, here's the multi-tracks so that you can have it for yourself to do the same things that I'm doing. You know, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Is that a good idea or, or does that sound too involved? I don't know. Rendering MIDI to audio on Cakewalk by Bayon Lab because the last time I tried, it totally messed it up. Yeah, um, you're talking about with Melodyne, right? Because that's definitely one of the cool options of Melodyne. Now, it's not always going to be 100% spot on. I've noticed that myself. Um, and there's actually, there's I think there's two different ways to do that within Cakewalk by Band Lab too. Um, there's a way where you can render it in the timeline, like dragging it up to the top. And then there's also a way, I believe, where you can do it through Melodyne, obviously. But yeah. Um, I'm actually covering that in the video. That's one thing that I am covering in the Melodyne video. Um, but even in the video, it doesn't do a good job because one of the things that I was trying to showcase, which it, it still can work, like let's say you have a bass line that's missing a note where you think there should be a there should be like a an A flat here. There should be a, a B here. Uh, the cool thing about it is you can just literally with your voice be like, boom, record that into Melodyne, move it to where you want, export it as a MIDI, move that into a MIDI bass track, and boom, there's your note. So, 
Now that's worst case scenario. Obviously best case scenario is just to have the person re-record it or to get a better sample yourself. So, all right. Mario says that's a great idea. Uh, well, he says it's a good idea. Not a great, don't want to, don't want to overemphasize there, Mario. Yes. Uh, we will do that then. So why? Because Mario thinks it's a good idea. That's why we're doing it. And Mario, I want you to remember you're good enough. You're smart enough and doggone it. People like you. And because you've said it's a good idea, I think it's a good idea. So yeah, we're going to do it. I've been wanting to do it anyway. Honestly, I just think it'd be cool to that way. You have live interaction. You got people that can actually stop you. Of course, there's a little bit of a lag. I mean, there's like a 32, 28, 32 second lag from the, the chat section to whatever I'm saying or doing right now, but it would still be enough time for you to say, Hey, I, I was wondering, could you back up and show why you just EQ'd the bass guitar that way? You know, that would be a lot more beneficial to everyone involved. I think rather than just putting a static tutorial out there and saying, here's how you EQ a mix, you know, and then you would basically have to sit there and watch me ramble instead of going, Whoa, 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 stop buddy. Why'd you do that? So, and what are the benefits of learning good EQ? Well, we just talked about one of the benefits is getting good stereo width, obviously balanced mixes that are full of clarity, um, removing low end mud, uh, Zave, what is up Zave? Nice to have you on here. Hey, and he comes, he comes packing a question too. Good deal. Or no, I think he's given an answer. Mark, if you freeze the MIDI track, it basically turns into an audio track and just keeps the, keep it super safe. Drag the waveform into a new empty audio track. Zave, that is genius, man. That is an ingenious idea to an otherwise, uh, I can't believe I didn't even think of that. I mean, I can because I'm not, I'm not super bright, but <laughs> that is like a, whoa, that's next level, Zave. You need to market that, buddy. We need to make a shirt about that. That's amazing. Why didn't I ever think about that? See, this is why I love these streams. I learned so much from you guys too. It's amazing. Um, seemed like I seen a question up here that I missed. Maybe not. Oh no, that was, we were still going on about the, the audio thing. So, all right. Well, it appears that, uh, one of the things that we were just talking about was the EQ and how that it can benefit in several different ways. Let me show you one way, by the way, that EQ will help dramatically. Now, we just looked at this together, the last live stream, but I wanna showcase this again, just to show you how much EQ can help. And for those of you that know the caveat and the crescendo moment to this, just, you're gonna to have to bear with me because I think it's pretty cool. So let's go over to the desktop real quick. Da, da, da. Maybe. Where did I do it? Yeah, there it is. Boom. Hey, I'm at the desktop. How's it going? All right. So <laughs> we're. I'm in a mood today. I'm like in some rare form. I don't know. All right. So this is not to degrade or put down anything about James's mix. To be honest, when he sent it to me, it sounded really good, just the way that it was. Um, but let me show you what proper EQ technique can do. So this is James. James's mix and hopefully it comes through. Okay, and this is my mix with proper EQ moves made. Yet again, just simple EQ moves. And here is the crescendo moment. I love this part. James's mix had about 15 to 20 plugins on it. My mix had none. Yes, I said that. Now, apart from obviously the EQ, but literally I removed everything off the pro channel. Every plugin was removed off of the tracks. 
And the only thing that I used on the pro channel, apart from all of the other things that I removed is the one thing you can't remove, which is the EQ and literally went through there within 30 minutes, uh, on a Skype call with him and said, okay, we're going to take your mix from here to here in 30 minutes, just using EQ and faders. Got it to sound like that clarity punch sounds great. And that's, that's before we've even sweetened it up. We've done no reverb delays, cool stuff like that. That's just that. So that's what proper EQing can do for you. So hopefully we, we might even with James permission, we might even just use his song. That would be cool. Um, I have to say that it was easy to do that just simply because James sent me a, a mix, um, that was just really well done as well. So, but yeah, understanding the proper theories or not even theories, uh, practical applications behind EQ will get you from point A to point B. Let's do that again. I just, I want to listen to that. And this time I'm going to start out with his and just AB back and forth. So look for these S's when this top S is on right here, you see this track highlighted, that's his. And when it switches to here, that's mine. So we'll just kind of AB them back and forth real quick. So here's the thing that I love about that. Um, the first time I can't remember who it was. I let them listen to that and they said, yeah, but the bass has dropped dramatically. And then the longer they listened to it, they went, but it's still there. I still hear it. Like it's still punchy, but it's dropped dramatically. And so I asked the question, I said, so does it sound bad? No but I just noticed the bass drop dramatically. So 90% of this was literally carving out bass frequencies to get all of that to just open up. So that's EQ for you. All right, guys. So this has been another edition of Sound Advice Saturday. Unfortunately, I do have to head off of here today. I hope that it's been useful. I hope that um, you've gained something from this. If you have any questions whatsoever, you don't have to just ask them here. You, you're more than welcome to email me at uh, homestudiosimplified at gmail.com. And we will definitely uh, get you the best possible answer that we can there. Um, if at any time you want to contact me here on the channel, leave a comment in the comment section below any video. And I, I answer every one of my comments. And here lately it's getting harder because more people are commenting. But... <laughs> I usually just take about 15, 30 minutes um, out of every two hours, three hours, and just sit down and answer a bunch of comments or uh, try to find people some good answers if I don't have them myself. But uh, All right, Zave's dropping some more knowledge bombs here. He says, uh, also Mark with synths, I only found this out recently. You can set the input of an empty audio track as the synth. Arm the audio track, hit record. Yes. Yes. Uh, one thing about that too, is the aux tracks. Not a lot of people utilize aux tracks as much as I think they should. And what I mean by that is if I was to create an aux track, so, um, da -da -dum -dum. okay. So let's say this one right here. So if I go insert send and I say new aux track, now here's the cool part. So I've just created a send. That's going to work much like a send would work to a bus. Okay. But, um, the difference is it's here on the track pane, which means I can treat it just like a, a normal track, but here's where it gets even cooler. Okay. I know I keep saying that, but it does it gets even cooler. Now I can create a send, uh, insert a send to that same aux track. Okay. Now, if I wanted to, I could send all of my tracks to that one aux track and create a submix. 
So I could create a mix within a mix and say, okay, this is my mix without drums. This is my mix without bass guitar. This is my mix without vocals. Um, if I wanted to do it that way for like karaoke or um, if I was training a drummer to be a drummer, I could say, hey, here's here's the multi-tracks, but this is a, a version of it without drums. And it would be super quick. Another thing about this that I love doing is you can actually take four or five guitar tracks, blend them all down to this one stereo track, send as many as you want, as much as you want, pan it how you want, because however you pan them on the individual track is how it pans in the aux track. And then once you do that, you've got one track now and you can delete the other six if you like it, that is. Or if you want to save yourself, you know, that uh, that fire escape, then you can always leave them. But here I said I was trying to go and I'm, I'm showing more stuff. Anyway. <laughs> and you couldn't even see it because my mug's in the way. Hold on. There it is. There's the aux track I was talking about. So you can create sins from various different tracks to go to this aux track and essentially use it like a bus, but on your track pane. You can do the same thing that you would with normal tracks here instead of having to go to a separate screen or not to mention it's just, it's really handy, especially if you have uh, what I love doing with is a DI bass and a bass amp recording. Just blend them together on the same track and do away with the other two. So, all right, guys, thank you all so much. Yes, that does save CPU as well. <laughs> I keep trying to go and then I keep throwing in more nuggets here. All right, guys. Well, anyway, thank you so much for hopping on the stream today. I want to give some shout outs real quick. These are all the individuals who have either subscribed or super chatted within the last few days. You all know who you are. You lovely people love each and every one of my subscribers. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That's not just something that I say. It's not just a, a YouTube terminology. I really do care for each one of you. And that's why I take the time to do what I do. And that's why I take the time to answer your questions and answer every single comment because I know how it was whenever I first started out I had nobody nobody was willing to help and I eventually found a couple of people online that I clung to that did actually reach out and, and help me a little um, but I wanted to be what I never had when I was first getting started in this and now that I have enough knowledge under my belt that I can actually get things to sounding like they should I thought, well, this would be a good opportunity for me to start putting myself out there and giving of myself more because it's the law of sowing and reaping. Uh, I've seen it time and time again in my life. When, when you give, it shall be given unto you. And when you sow uh, good seeds, seeds of, of helpfulness and seeds of, of kindness, and, and when I tell you guys that I love each and every one of you, I mean that. And, um, and it's okay, by the way, for another man to tell another man that they love them. Um, if it's in the right sense, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with, with affection. There's nothing wrong with, with being a sensitive person. In fact, most musicians are sensitive and, uh, that's just part of who I am anyway. Um, I've always been like that. I'm the kind of guy that I uh, find some good friends and before they leave my presence I say, Hey man, just want to let you know, I love you. Love you, man. I get some weird looks, but that's okay. <laughs> At any rate, uh, thank you all so much. Thank you everyone who has subscribed, who has super chatted, who has helped along the way. Um, James is on here. Thank you so much, James, for stepping up, uh, as well as Zave, and becoming a Patreon member. I know that uh, during times like this, it's really hard, especially to give of your finances. And I want to let you know that I do not take it lightly. And I not only do I appreciate it, but I want to use that as well to give back in some way, shape, or form. And so if you're just hopping on and you wasn't here for the first half of this, uh, during the 5,000 subscriber giveaway, I'm actually using the Super Chat donations to purchase the prize for that giveaway. So you guys are actually helping to give back as well. So until next time, guys, it's been a really great live stream. Loved having each, each and every one of you on here, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So the next one, we'll try to schedule... Um, the EQ tutorial, if you want to call it that, where basically I can um, try to build it up and let you guys know way ahead in, in advance, like this is the day that we're doing it, so you can kind of block out the the uh, the scheduling. And then, man, I've got trains going on. I've got my wife's opening the door. I've got 
man, this is so distracting. Okay. So at any rate, we will be doing that soon. Thanks to your guys' uh, suggestions. And remember, anything that you guys suggest, if it's within my power to do to help you, I will try to do my best to do so. So until next time, guys, remember that this channel exists to simplify the complexities of the home studio and to help you make professional sounding music in a less than professional space. You all know we can dream alone and we can create alone, but together we can achieve so much more. God bless each and every one of you.